So as we look at this particular text, David is in his latter years. King David has gone before them and he has fought many a battle. And we began to know David as a mighty warrior. I mean, it was David who slay Goliath, the Amaya, with two sling, with a slingshot and two smooth rocks. It was David who God utilized to expand the territory of the Israelites. It was David that went before them and led them into battle after battle after battle after battle. And David was this mighty soldier who continued to avenge God in every way. When they would go out to battle and David would win a fight, Arlene, when they would come back, the people would say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Translation, David was a bad boy. And nobody messed with David as he led the children of Israel into battle. But David was only a mighty warrior, but David was a worshiper. David loved him some God and did not mind showing that he loved himself some God. David worshiped. There's one time uh, when, they, when they bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, David begins to dance out of his clothes. He worships so hard, he danced out of his gear. But Nehemiah, this is David who also says stuff like this because we forget that David was also a poet and a musician. And it is David who says, as the deer pants after the water brook. So pants my soul for you, O oh Lord. God, I yearn for you, is what he's saying. I have a deep desire for you. My heart is thirsty for you. Look at what he says in the next one, Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Early shall I seek you. My soul thirsts. For you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I'm in the spiritual desert right now, <laughs> and I am dry. I feel disconnected because I have not had the opportunity to come into your presence, God, and I don't like the way this feels. So I'm gonna rise early in the morning and give you praise and give you honor and give you glory. Open up my mouth and say thank you for my day. Open up my mouth and say I appreciate you for all the things that you have done and all the things that you are going to do, Father God. I see the sun rising, Father God, and I give you some praise, Father God. I hear the birds singing, Father God, and I give you some praise on this morning. I feel the cool breeze coming across me on this morning, Father God, and I give you some praise. I rise early in the morning. He says to give you praise because my, my soul needs it. I can't make it to my day, Crystal. Woo-hoo, what he said. I can't make it. I can't get my day started right. That's what he's saying. I can't get my day started right unless I get up and give you some glory. <laughs> Look at what David. David says, I will bless you at all times. Your praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul, I like that part, shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Somebody says, Oh, magnify the Lord 
with me. And let us exalt his name. <laughs> David was a worshiper. And he believed in giving God everything. But then David was also a mighty man of faith. A man who was intentional when it came to his things of faith. David was known as a man after God's own heart. How was he able to get that reputation? Because he loves God so much that he pursued him with everything that he had. He loved God so much. He says, God, I put all of my trust in you. When they were in the battle against the Philistines and they were scared to go and face Goliath, it is young teenage David who says, the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear is the same God who would deliver us from this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine giant. He's not in covenant with God. <laughs> David says, we are in covenant with God. God is watching over us. He has made promises to us. And I intend to fulfill one of these promises. Where's my slingshot? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't need your armor. It's too big for me. I just need my slingshot and those stones. And let's get it. He was a man of faith. So he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the steel. He restored my soul. He leads me down the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen to this now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? And when the faith comes in, thou art with me. That's where the faith comes in. Thou art with me. I see the enemies in front of me. And I know they want to take me out of here, but I, in my faith, understand that God prepares a table for me. God is going to take care of me. By faith. But Danielle, can I say this? David was a great man. But David was not a perfect man. Amen. A great man, yeah. great warrior, great worshiper, a man of tremendous faith, but he was not perfect. And that sounds like a lot of us. Talented, yeah. but not perfect. Yeah. Smart, but not perfect. Great fathers, but not perfect. Great husbands, but not perfect. Great leaders, but not perfect. But great mechanics, in the honor of Father's Day, but not perfect. Great chefs, but not perfect. Great teachers, but not perfect. Great worshipers, but not We have our issues. And when you begin to talk about David, David had his share of things that he was going through, the things that he had to deal with. And one of them is David had some issues with being a father. Super talented, but there was times in which he was lax on his duty in being a father. There was times in which David did not take the action 
that he needed to take. And as a result, tumultuous things took place. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's dive deep into this story. Put my story bow hat off here. We're going to dive deep into this story. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now, David, like I said, is late in his years. He's already fought many battles. God has already used him to expand the territory. They were once a tribe, a group of 12 tribes, and they were like nomads traveling all throughout the area. But with David in charge, they became a kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And they were a mighty force that was feared. Throughout the known world. But now David is late in his years. He has children who are older. And now David finds himself wrestling with some adult children. He has a beautiful daughter by the name of Tamar. Drop dead gorgeous. But he also had a son by the name of Anna, who has trouble controlling himself. So he looks at Tamar in all of his of her beauty, but instead of doing the right thing and going and asking her father David for her hand in marriage, Anna. Violates her. Half sister, but still a sister. He violates his sister. And then kicks her out the house. Now, when Absalom, Tamar's fool, well, learns of this, he is. Angry, mad, livid, upset. And David is also mad and angry. But David does not do anything. Now the law says that if any man violates a woman against her will, he should be put to death. And David is the king. He is the man who has the authority to issue out punishment. But David does not do anything. Sometimes we try to sweep our issues under the rug. Those difficult to deal with issues, those troublesome issues, yeah. those family issues that can be somewhat embarrassing, yeah. awkward, yeah. things we don't want anybody else to know about, yeah. things in which you really don't have to get down into the mud to really begin to address them and discuss them and get beyond what we see now and begin to get some healing. We don't want to deal with we want to grab our broom and sweep that stuff up on the rug. I think that we keep it up underneath the rug, Arlene. Maybe one day it'll go away. We don't have to deal with it. We have to do all these emotions. Hopefully it'll go away. But here's what I learned. You can try to sweep that stuff up underneath the rug all you want, but it just continues to come back over and over and over again. You can sweep it under the rug today. Next month, it comes back. At the family reunion, it comes back. <laughs> Yes, Lord. That's right. At Christmas, yeah, no it comes back. Yes, Lord. Birthdays, yes, yes, yes. It, is. it comes back. Mm -hmm. 
we have to eventually deal with the issues. No matter how much we try to sweep that stuff up beneath the rug, it does not stay. It's like dust. When you raise that rug up and lay that rug back down, it flies all over. Some of us are struggling right now in our parental relationship because we try to sweep stuff yeah. under the rug. Mm -hmm. And we never really oh. dealt with the oh. issues. And now you had a father or a mother who was sitting here struggling, yeah. wanting to have a relationship with their child. You yeah. have a child who wants to be affirmed by their parents, wants to be loved by their parents, but nobody deals with the dust up underneath the room. We go through the motions. We fake it. Just don't talk about this. Just don't step on the rug. <laughs> Go ahead. Just don't step on the rug. We're going to talk about baseball. We're going to talk about softball. We're talking about the movies. We're talking about getting something to eat. But we're not going to not gonna deal with that stuff. But come on, here's some stuff so I've I'm learned too. The hard way. That if you don't address the issue, if you don't speak, then the silence begins to speak yeah. for you. If you don't address the issue and begin to talk about the yeah. issue and what's really going on with the issue, people, let me end again, that Satan in people's mind will begin to define what you mean and what you are saying. Right. He don't love me. He don't care about me. She don't value me. Come on, come on. That's not how I feel, but you didn't say anything. Yeah, right. Have opened up your mouth. Yeah. We haven't addressed the issue. Yeah. There's somebody in pain. They're trying to figure yeah. out why I'm dealing with this pain right yeah. here. And in the midst of dealing with this pain, all different types of thoughts and ideas are running through the yeah. mind, trying to rationalize all of this stuff. So if we never say anything, we never yeah. address the yeah. pain, yeah. 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 then people draw their own conclusions yeah. about what's real. Right. Right. And that's what we have here. David did not address the issue. So Absalom says, I got it. Two years go by without any action. Nothing takes place. But then Absalom says, I'm going to throw a party. My sheep are going to get cheered. They're going to cut all the wool off of my sheep. And we're going to celebrate that. But how many people know they really wasn't there? To celebrate. He was doing one of them gangster moves. One of them gaudy things. You know what I'm saying? Let me set him up. We're going to bring him over to my house and then when everybody else turns away, y'all kill him. And that's exactly what happened. I told y'all. Jerry Springer type stuff. <laughs> Kills. When David hears of this, David is upset. He's angry. Mm -hmm. But once again, David does nothing. Absalom flees. But instead of going to get Absalom, bring some restoration back, some healing back, to deal with his son before his son does something else, David stays in a comfortable confine of the palace and does nothing. Yeah. Now, 
Because David loved Absalom. He loves Absalom with everything that he has. But I think when we look at Absalom, at David, David struggles with something that a lot of us, especially those of us as men, struggle with. We struggle with expressing our feelings to our little ones. Especially when there's some trials and where there's some tribulation, where there's some dust underneath the rug, we struggle in expressing how we feel about the situation. Yeah. And for some of us, this is what we would call learned behavior. Because our dads did not love us in that same, our dads were not the type of dads who walked over and hugged us. Yeah. Said, I love you Come on. to us. Our dads were not the type of men who said, I'm proud of you. I'm glad that you are my child. And there was something on the inside of us yearning for dad to say that. But dad was not going to say that because he don't do none of that weak stuff. I'm a man. Let me show you how I express my love. That food you ate, boy. That's my love for you. When I go down to that job every day and I don't want to go and they're talking bad about me, but I still go, that's my love for you. That roof over your head, them shoes on your feet, that's my love for you. Some of us were wanting you. Just a little bit more. Can I get another love you? Yeah. Along with the chicken. Yeah. Can, can I get a hug? Yeah. With the mashed potatoes? Right. Can you tell me you're proud of me when I bring this report? Can I, can I get some proud of you? I see you working. But our dads were struggling. Here's the thing I learned. It does not mean that they were bad men. It does not mean that they were bad fathers. They were great at some things, but not so great at others. So it is our perspective. Let me show you what I mean. Let me tell you the story. Michael Jr., you guys saw him in the movie War Room. He was the guy who was in that weight room. You have never seen him. He's a comedian. Does great stuff. Google him, YouTube, and you'll find him out there. But Michael Jr. talks about his dad. He says, my dad, Nehemiah, was 100% perfect because he was not perfect. And he tells the story of his dad cutting his hair. He said his dad would cut his hair and his dad would just parade him while he was cutting his hair. Be still, boy. Stop moving, boy. I'm going to mess up your hair. I'm trying to get this fade right. Be still, boy. You can't know what's wrong with you. You know how we can be sometimes. We tense. We upset and we take our anger out on somebody who can't do anything but sit there and have to listen to us. And that frustrated him. But when he got older, his uncle told him a story about his dad. And he said when his dad, which would be Michael's grandfather, would cut his dad's hair, he would beat him if he would not be still. Hit him with the clippers upside the head, blood coming down because he would not be still. His dad was a beat him. When Michael heard that, it changed his perspective. See, when my dad didn't beat me, he was a yeller. So my dad went a little bit further, got a little bit better than the previous generation. So then he made up his mind, I'm not going to be a yeller 
or a beard. I'm going to utilize this haircutting time as a time of joy and laughter with my son. He chose to have a different perspective. He could have been angry. He could have been vengeful. He could have said, I don't have anything to do with you, Dad, because of some of the stuff you said to me. And he chose to find the good in his family. And I just want to encourage you. In the midst of your anger and frustration and disconnect from your father, whether he's still here or not, find some good. There was some good inside of him. He wasn't perfect, but he was still a good man. And there's some goodness there. Find it. If you look for it, you'll find it. If you look for the negative, You'll find it. It all depends on what you're looking for. That's what you're going to find. <laughs> I'll just jump back into this story. So Absalom has been in exile for about three years. He went to his maternal grandfather's house and he's just chilling. Once again, David takes no action. But Joab the commander of the army, the general sees David. And he sees David always concerned about his boy. He yearns to see Absalom. He wants to be restored, but something is stopping him from making a move. So Joab utilizes a wise woman to tell David a story. And this story motivates David to allow Joab to bring Absalom back home. But here's the caveat. It says he can come home, but he can't come home. He can go to his own spot over there, but he can't come to the palace and see me. He has to stay over there in a pseudo exile. David Nehemiah refused to look beyond his pain so that he can find some reconciliation. And there's times in which we have this pain on the inside of us but we refuse to look beyond the pain so that we can find some healing, we can find restoration, we can find reconciliation. We're stuck right here in the pain. Yes. Yes. And all we can see is what happened to us and the pain that came from that which happened to us. And that pain begins to dictate what we do. Whenever we look at the person, all yeah. we see is the pain. The pain. Yeah. Yeah. The pain causes us to be angry yeah. and vengeful yeah. and say things we have no business saying yeah. and do things we have no business doing. But it's the pain on the inside of us that's talking. We did this a few summers ago. We said that hurting people hurt other people. The pain is driving many of us. We don't want restoration because of the pain. We refuse to allow ourselves to be hurt like that again. So we put this steel wall around our hearts. I'm not going to make myself vulnerable. I'm not going to give you another chance to hurt me. Yes. Do I want to be loved? Yes, I want to be loved. But I'm not going to let you get close to me to love me the way I deserve to love because you might hurt me. I'm going to keep you at bay. Come on. Yes, we do. God, love we do. Yeah. All day long. We do. And India, here's the thing I've learned. 
that that thing begins to transfer yeah. Yeah. from the person who did us wrong yeah. to everybody else yeah. that comes into our life. Yeah. Unconsciously, we put this barrier up because I'm not going to get hurt yeah. again. The perpetrator was Joe. But when Mary shows up, she gets the same stone cold reaction. When John shows up, the same stone cold reaction. Yeah. When that boo we've been waiting on all our life and praying shows up, he gets the same stone cold reaction. We marry him or we marry her and we go through this relationship with the distance between us because we refuse to move beyond the pain. We still stuck right here. That was Joe right We still stuck right here. No way Joe did it. Right. Still, still stuck right here in the pain. We gotta learn to look beyond the pain so that we can stop the bleeding in our relationships. Say that one more time. Right there. Look beyond the pain so that we can stop the bleeding in our relationships. Pain is there. Pain move by the way. I want restoration. I want healing. I want to love and I want to be loved. I can't sit here with all this pain right now. Pain move by. I need to look beyond because you're clouding my. Yeah. Let me put my spiritual eyes on. Yeah. And I can't look over the top. Let me put my spiritual eyes on. Look at. Yeah. The eyes of grace. Yeah. The eyes of love. Yeah. The eyes of mercy, yeah. the eyes of forgiveness, yeah. the eyes of perspective. Let me put that stuff on. That's what Michael Jr. said that he was going to do. I'm going to change my perspective and look at this situation differently. Get beyond the pain. Get beyond the pain. So now we can have a civil conversation about that stuff on the knee. Right? David doesn't do that. So about two more years go by. Let's do the math. Two years went by between Tamar being violated and Absalom doing something. Absalom, I say right. Absalom doing something about it. Absalom spends three years in exile. So now we got five years. Comes back and he spent two more years in this pseudo exile. Seven years have gone by since the incident took place. Seven years have gone by. A lot of festivals have taken place. A lot of celebrations have taken place. A lot of Passovers have taken place. Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths, in which everybody gathered together to have fun and do things. A lot of birthdays have gone by. And we still haven't dealt with this issue. So my man Absalom says, okay. I'm going to request to come before the presence of the king. But Joab wouldn't do it. Joab wouldn't go talk to the king. But Absalom was persistent. He kept doing it, kept going out, kept going. Go and talk. Come here so I can send you so you can go and talk to the king for. Go talk to my daddy. Sounds crazy. For me. Well, Joel ignores him. But Absalom, then Absalom said, I got you. Go set his field on fire. Jerry Spring style stuff. Go set his field on fire. His <laughs> means of providing for his family. Go set that on fire. I bet you'll come see what I have to say now. Joab did it. Set his field on fire. Here come 
I'm sorry, Amazon, Amazon did it. Said it's still on fire, and here comes Joey. What you doing, bro? Why you set my field on? You wouldn't come when I asked you. <laughs> now I need you to go talk to the king and let him know I want to talk to him. Joab does that. David says, bring him on. Mm -hmm. Absalom comes to the king, bows down before the king as a sign of respect. And then David kisses him as a sign of restoration. And that's where Disney comes in. Because that would be a great Disney movie, right? They have all the t-shirts for it. You know, you, you put it in the in the in the theme park, Disney World. You you want a couple of TV shows out of that, spin-offs, all that great stuff. If it ended that way. But it didn't. Because Absalom still had anger in his heart. He goes and he bows down for in respect to his father, but the anger was still there. And the anger began to dictate to him what he was going. The anger began to talk to him and say, we're going to overthrow this kingdom. Like pain, anger can get us in trouble. Look at these scriptures here. Where's the difference between them? It says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Look at this next one. A hot tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. It's that anger that can get us sometimes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Somebody does something to you, and it infuriates you. You are irate. You are angry. You don't want to do anything else but take your fist and run it right through their brains. That's all you want to do. Drop kick them, pick them up, shake them a little bit. You want to make them feel just as bad as you feel. You hurt me, I want to hurt you. The pain, I don't care, y'all act like y'all, that's like y'all Chris, but y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. That pain, that anger gets in the way. And because we don't address the anger, it becomes fuel for other stuff. Murder comes from unaddressed anger. Tongue lashings come from unaddressed anger. Abuse comes from unaddressed anger. People who are up and down, temperamental, are dealing with some unaddressed anger. Absalom. Think about Absalom. He murders his brother because of some unaddressed mm -hmm. anger. He finds himself in exile for three years, followed by two years because of some unaddressed anger. He's disconnected from his father because of some unaddressed anger. Anger. He starts a rebellion, overthrows his father, the king, usurps himself and says, I am the king now because of some unaddressed anger. He ends up getting killed in battle because of some unaddressed anger. What about you? What are you going through because of some unaddressed anger? What 
relationship is suffering because of some unaddressed anger. Anger that's just boiling. Boiling on the inside of you. And it says, don't let them get close to you. Don't talk to them. Don't let them off the hook. Don't accept their apology. Don't you forgive them. Undressed anger. But I just want to encourage you in the morning. This morning. To change your perspective. Was daddy perfect? No. Was daddy wrong for what he did? Yes. Are we trying to make excuses for daddy? No. But are we going to live the rest of our lives in pain and anger because of what daddy did or did not do? There's time for healing. It's time for restoration. It's time to deal with the stuff underneath the roof. Healing. You can't be whole and the person that you were created to be until the healing takes place. There's something missing. And because that anger is still there. And that pain is still there. Restoration can take place. If we would change our perspective. Daddy did the best he could. He, did, he had his own issues, his own demons he was battling with while he was trying to raise us, doing the best we could, he could. And we might not understand all the nuances, catches, especially when it comes to the relationship with mom. <laughs> we don't understand everything that took place. And why it took place. Come on. And some of us have gotten older now, and now that we are married and we are keep we have kids, we understand that everything is not just black and white. There's nuances in that stuff. Yeah. And now that we have an increased knowledge and wisdom and the understanding, can we give dad a break? Hmm. Can we seek reconciliation with dad? Restoration with dad? Healing with dad? Forgiveness with dad? Dad deserves it. And you deserve it. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you. Who you are in our life, God. We thank you for being our king and our Lord God. We thank you for being our master. For all the things that you have done, you are going to continue to do for us, Father. For your love and your grace and your mercy and your joy and your peace and your strength. We thank you for being our strong power, strong tower, Father God, our prince of peace. God, we know you as a God of restoration. A God of healing. And Father God, we dealt with some deep stuff on this one. But we entrust the hearts of everyone in here and everyone online to you. Help us, Father God. Deal with the stuff underneath the rug. 
Help us with our conversations. Those areas in which we don't know what to say and how to say it, Father God, help us articulate. Help us with our pain. And that pain rise up, remind us, Father God, that you're in charge, that you're in control, that we do not have to bow down at the throne of pain and allow pain to dictate to us what happens. Well, you are the throne of our Help us deal with our anger. When we start acting out of character, Father God, remind us, snap us back, Father God, remind us who you are. What you can do, what you want to do for us. Healing for God. Father God, we pray for your spirit. Before we even have these conversations, Father God, send your Holy Spirit, Father God. Allow the Spirit to go before us and begin to communicate for us, Father God. Break down walls, help us understand one another, Father God. Help us understand. And when we get stuck, remind us, Father God, of what you can do for us. God, we trust you. So hear our hearts. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.